Good morning, church. I would like to thank our senior pastor, Dr. Johnson Rai, our deacon board, the members of the church, and above all, our Lord, for giving me this opportunity this morning to come before all of you and to share his word with you all. Shall we look to God in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, and as I stand here, I ask that you speak through me, make me your instrument and your tool, Lord, and that the words that come out of my mouth bring glory to you, bring honor to you, and may it edify your church, your body. Hear our prayers, Lord. Hear my prayer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. In 2 Peter, when we see Peter writing, he writes to the Jewish and the Gentile believers that spread throughout the Asia Minor region. These believers were well versed in the Old Testament. Now, the focus of this epistle was to make sure that the believers to whom Peter was writing were aware of the false teachings, the false practices, and the doctrines that were being taught to them. Peter here guides and encourages his fellow believers to observe their lives as Christians, to walk close to the Lord, to remember that the Lord will return, and he reminds them to stand firm in their faith to God. In the passage that has been chosen for today, we see how Peter exhorts his audience to live a Christian life that is centered in Christ. Keeping this in mind, I have titled my sermon for today, Mirrors on the Inside. Do you see Christ? Mirrors on the Inside. Do you see Christ? In verse 1, we find Peter greeting his audience. He presents himself not as the rock upon which the church is built, Matthew 16, 18, but rather as one who is the same as any other believer. He calls himself a servant of our Lord. Some translations use slave, some use bond servant. It shows the humility and the humbleness that Peter has. He does not place himself higher than the others, and nor does he believe himself to be of a different ilk, just because he was an apostle, an original member of the Twelve. No. He goes on further to state that fellow believers who have come to faith in Christ and through Christ's righteousness are those who receive a faith that is just as precious and just as same as that the apostles have. He does not segregate himself and the other apostles from the believers. He places everyone on an even field. And in doing so, he effectively places everyone as equal inheriting members to the kingdom of God. However, this is not the focus or purpose behind Peter's epistle. He writes from verse 2 to 4 about the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter here sheds insight on what it is that we, as believers and fellow inheritors of the kingdom of God, need and should be adhering to. He roots our lives in the knowledge of God. This knowledge is not secret. Rather, it is a knowledge of Christ. It is about knowing that we have been called by Him. It is about the grace that each and every one of us have received. It is about the path that is laid out before us to live a life of godliness. Godliness here does not reflect to the same standards of the world and of what one thinks when they hear the word. It is not about being religious or being pious. It is about inheriting and sharing the divine nature of God. 
To inherit the nature of God does not mean to suddenly have supernatural abilities and the like. No. It means to have our character become like His. We do not give in to corrupt desires. We move away from what has held us prisoners in the past. We now find freedom in God. It is through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that we inherit and share God's nature. We identify ourselves through it and in it. And this brings me to our first point for today. Identifying yourself in Christ and the knowledge of Him. Once again, the first point that I would like to make for today is identifying yourself in Christ and in the knowledge of Him. We all live a different walks of life. We do different things. We have different roles to play, each and every one of us, wherever we are and whatever part of the society we belong to. However, we are united as one in the body of Christ. If there's one thing that you and I should not have a difference in, it should be Christ. Let me say that again. If there's one thing that you and I should not have a difference in, it should be Christ. It is through knowing Him and accepting Him that we are born again. Just as there are foundations upon which houses are built, our foundation comes through Christ. Our identity is created through Christ. We all identify ourselves as people from certain groups, cultures, or places. Now, right here within our church, we have such a diverse crowd. Now, if you would allow me and if you would partake with me in just a very small activity, if I call out the people you are, the group that you belong to, would you please raise your hand? Our Bengali community, all Bengalis over here, please raise your hand. What about people who are from the South India region, Tamils and the Telugus, if those among us are here, please raise your hand. We also have people who are from Manipur, Manipur people, please raise your hand. We also have our Naga people over here, would you please raise your hand? Anglo-Indians, if y'all are here, would y'all also please? And if we have anybody who is from Mizoram, would you please raise your hand? Nepalese? And then, our people from Orissa. And those who are Chinese. Also, we even have people within our congregation from the United States. Would you please raise your hand? If you've taken a look around, you'd see we have such a diverse crowd. But let me ask you something. And think about what I'm going to ask of in your minds. It should be able to click and connect with what I'm about to say. When you think of your own culture, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? What is that first image? Take a few moments if you want. Close your eyes if you have to. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of your own culture? The first thing you just thought of is very likely to be the thing that you generally identify your culture and your people with. That is the very first thing that you come to a conclusion of when you think of your culture and your people. You're only able to do this because of the experience you have had since you were a child growing up in that surrounding. The association of things to them is what embeds that experience in us. It embeds that identity of those things to our identity. Eventually, 
with the passage of time, this association becomes inseparable. It might be a little funny, but one example that came to me when I was preparing my sermon was a very Kolkata-like example, the biryani. When you think of biryani in Kolkata, there's no way that you can separate the potato, the, the alu, from biryani. It is very unique to our city. I don't know state, but I would say our city. You cannot think of it without that potato. If you go anywhere else in India, or for that matter, anywhere in the world where they serve it, and if it isn't made by a person who's from Kolkata, you would not enjoy it. That is the association we have. Likewise, as believers, we cannot disassociate ourselves with Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, do you associate all that you do with Christ? Do you know him? Do you know Christ or do you know of him? Again, do you know him or do you know of him? Anyone can be well versed in the Bible if they choose so to study it. However, they have the free will to make the choice of not believing a single word that is written in the scriptures. A person can come to church throughout their life. They may have been to Sunday school since they were small. They may have attended the youth fellowship. However, if they do not choose to identify with Christ, and if they choose not to know Him after knowing of Him, who are they? Who are you? Which side of the fence are you on? Do you identify yourself as a person who is in Christ? The audience Peter was writing to was one that was plagued both externally through persecution and internally through false teachings and the like. He writes to them to encourage them to walk with God. He, as we see, reminds them of the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this morning, let us remind ourselves of the very same thing. Let us remember the knowledge of God and of Christ our Savior. Let us reaffirm ourselves to Him. Let us know Him and not just know of Him. Knowledge alone, however, is not the only thing Peter talks about. He mentions of a few qualities, attributes. These qualities that he talks about from verses 5 to 7 are essential to the growth of the Christian life. Allow me to illustrate. When we raise a tree, the general tendency is to plant seed in soil that is good. Often farmers work on fixing the soil before they go about planting the seeds. They need to know the type of land they are about to cultivate upon. If the soil is too sandy, it cannot hold enough water. And when harsh winds blow, the plants are very likely to get injured by the sand that is blowing around, thus either leading it to die or not grow very well. Now if the soil is too clay, it holds too much water. And that itself presents another problem, the problem of and the high possibility of the plant rotting right where it stands and grows. There must be good balance in the soil to promote healthy growth. There can be no extremes. They cannot be one over the other. To add to that, farmers must add things such as compost, manure, fertilizers, and the like to add nutrition to the soil. This aids the plants to grow. For a healthy plant to grow and to bear good fruit or vegetation, one must have a decent mix of the correct ingredients. It does not rely on one aspect only. It is not only about the soil. It is also about the mixture. It is also about the addition, the supplementation, 
of added, of added elements that make a difference on how a plant grows. With this, I would like to bring forward the second point of today's sermon. That is, characteristics of Christian growth. Once again, the second point is characteristics of Christian growth. When we read from verses 5 to 7, we are presented with the ingredients of what constitutes good soil. As brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look within ourselves, do we find within us the very characteristics that Peter mentions? Do we find these attributes in ourselves? Ask yourself that question. Do I find this within me? What are these attributes that Peter mentions? He starts off with faith. The very first underlying factor that sets apart believers from non-believers. What are we without our faith in Christ? Who are we without our faith in Christ? Such is the importance of faith that we as believers are identified by the world as Christians. Break the word apart. The very first part of that word is Christ. You are identified by Him. Christ resides not just as an attachment to the faith we profess and practice, but He also resides within you and within I. An amazing thing to think about if we were to marvel at the word Christian. Nonetheless, the etymology of the word Christian is not the focus of today. The characteristics and qualities mentioned by Peter are to faith, Peter adds virtue, or rather, as mentioned in the NIV translation, goodness. This itself stems from the faith that we have in Christ. To faith, he then adds goodness. And to that, he adds knowledge. Knowledge here playing a factor on the ethical and the moral judgment one makes because they identify themselves in Christ and know of Christ and who he is. This in turn plays a role in how we are to have self-control and patience. Self-control and patience comes because of the start of faith and knowing him and having goodness in our lives. This then leads to godliness, which then leads to mutual affection. And that eventually leads to love for one another. We see the fruit of the Spirit and some of its attributes mentioned in verses 5 to 7. Now, while verses 5 to 7 talk about goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, affection, and love. We have to remember that they are to work in tandem synchronization with one another and with the other attributes of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. However, now at this moment, I would like to bring our attention to the attribute of love. When we choose to believe in Christ as our Lord and as our Savior, believing is the very first step towards living the life God intends for you and for me to live. We as believers and followers are also expected to show and share the love of God. The love in verse 7 is not the kind that stems from lust, no. It is not the kind that is limited to friendship. It is not the kind that is restrained by the limitations of empathy. The love that is mentioned in verse 7 is the agape love. It is the unconditional love. The very love that God has for us and the kind that we are expected 
to cultivate and to grow. This is the love that is not limited to situations. It is not limited to factors nor criteria that have to be met. It is a love that comes because God loves us. God loves you. It is a love that God has for each and every one of us. That is the type of love it is. It is a love that we must show one another as it is the very same love that we have received from God. It is often said that children are great imitators of their parents and their elders. What they see and observe at home and in the environment they grow up around is the base upon which their characteristics are built. It molds them to become the unique and individual people they are eventually later on in life. This is the foundation upon which they develop and learn how to interact with others. Keeping this in mind, let me ask this question. Are we good examples to the children in and around our lives? What is it that they observe us do? How do they perceive us as? Do they see the love of God in and through our lives? Do they see the love of God in and through our lives? We are the children of God. God sets the perfect example for us as the parent, the one who loves without condition. Such is the unconditional love of God that he chose to forgive Israel after the continual failure to uphold the laws of the covenant again and again and again. Such was the extent of his love that he sent his son to die for our sins. The ever so familiar John 3.16 rings through and true in so many situations when we think of that verse, when we read that verse, and when we ponder upon its meaning. Such is the love of God that he extends his hands out to the world and awaits for us to come forward to him. To hold his hands and let him take us into his embrace. Such is his love that he forgives us for our past sins and renews us in him. We are made new through Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. What is it that God has not done for us? What is it that God has not done for us? God, in his ever-loving kindness, bestows upon us many things. The spiritual gifts given to people are meant to be used for the glory of God. However, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13, when you read it through, we see that Paul makes a clear statement on how gifts of various kinds, which are highly coveted by many people who attend churches, all of those gifts are useless if the person does not have love, if they do not have the characteristic of that compassion and that love which stems from God to them. Before moving on to the next part of the sermon, I would like to remind us all that if there's anything that we are to remember, it is that the Bible itself is a statement of his unconditional love. The life of Jesus is a testament of his unconditional love for each and every one of us. In that very moment when he was hung upon the cross. In all that he did and taught, we see that love is the primary factor behind all of it. My friends, let that be the example that we follow. 
Let Christ be the example that we follow. Now, we have seen how Peter emphasizes on the matter of the knowledge of God and the qualities one is to have if they choose to identify in and through him. However, Peter also issues an assurance, a warning, and an encouragement to his fellow believers in order to confirm the seriousness of knowing God and practicing the qualities he mentions. And this brings me to our third point for today. The third point is being citizens of the kingdom of God. Once again, being citizens of the kingdom of God. In verse 8, we see that Peter urges his audience to hold fast to the qualities he talks about in verses 5 to 7. And he tells them to increase them. He states that in doing so, and I would like to emphasize, they would not, they would not be ineffective and unproductive. Now, how does one go about doing this? How does one increase these qualities and how does one become effective and productive? There's a phrase that says, to master something, one must practice it for over 10,000 hours. One must practice something for over 10,000 hours to become a master at it. While the phrase talks about mastering something, one cannot ignore the fact that putting 10,000 hours behind doing something must constitute the increase of that very particular attribute, the one that we are trying to hone. Likewise, we should take heed of what Peter says and try to hold on to these qualities and increase them. What good is something that cannot be put to use? What good is something that does not yield productivity? Let us keep this in mind. Peter goes on further in verse 9 to state that the likeliness of not possessing the qualities we ought to have is like someone being short-sighted and blind. It's a very bold statement that is being made here, being short-sighted and blind. When Peter states, what Peter states can be taken as a warning to us believers. In many, way, in many ways, Peter takes into account the general human tendency. He takes the psyche of the person into mind. Being short-sighted and blind here can allude to many situations and scenarios in which a person cannot think ahead and look further than what is right in front of them. The actions they take are all about the here and the now, not about the what is to come. Interestingly, Peter also refers to the past of a person's life. When he talks about being short-sighted and blind, he states that it is like the person has forgotten that they have been cleansed from their past sins. He states that it is like the person has forgotten that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Such is the folly of people that they forget all that was and all that is to come. People want to live in the moment. They want to take each day, one day at a time. When we get used to something, we get comfortable. And because of that, complacency sets in. In complacency, we often forget what it is that we ought to do. Or we get so used to doing it that it becomes a tradition or something that must be done because it has always been done. We end up knowing the what and the how, but we forget the why. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we do the things we do? Why do we have to do the things we do? We must understand the importance of knowing Christ. It is because of Christ our sins have been washed away. It is because of Him we were given new life. There is no justification behind forgetting this. None at all. 
brothers and sisters, let us persevere in this as well. Let us not forget. While life may go on and about for each and every one of us, let us not forget that we are pardoned by the blood of Jesus. Let us not forget that. The qualities that Peter talks about in verses 5 to 7 are the very things that grounds us. This is the very reason why Peter mentions them. When I say grounds us here, I mean it keeps us rooted to Christ, in Christ, and in the knowledge of our past selves. We don't forget. We remember who we were. And we remember and acknowledge that it is because of Christ that we are no longer that person. We were once sinners, tainted and full of blemish. We had no way out of sin. And we were not, again, we were not a part of the kingdom of God. It was through the sacrifice of Christ that we are able to call ourselves heirs to the kingdom of God. It is because of Him that we are where we are today, each and every one of us. You are where you are today because of Him. I am where I am today because of Him. The qualities of goodness, the knowledge of God, self-control, perseverance, godliness, affection, and love are what reminds us of the things our Lord has done for us. These stand as markers that when we look back to Christ, these are some of the things that we must enact out in our lives. And this is what Peter talks about in verse 9. Our sins have been washed away by Christ. Our lives made anew. Peter reminds us always to remember and pursue these very qualities. Now, in verses 10 to 11, Peter encourages, encourages his audience. He tells them to confirm their calling and election. And in doing that, and in upkeeping the qualities that he talks about, that they would never stumble, that they would be warranted to enter the kingdom of God. To put it plainly, the calling and election that Peter talks about here is the calling each and every one of us receives when God chooses to enter our lives. A common confusion about a common confusion that people may have about the calling in Christian lives is that it is a calling to serve God in full-time ministry while that has its own place. Let me clear this confusion. That is not the case with each and everybody. Let me clarify this first when I say that. When we are called by God, we are elected in this process. We are brought into the fold. We are not left outside. And it is because we have chosen to submit ourselves to the Lord that we are granted permission into His kingdom as heirs. There is no criteria that states that we can only serve God and answer His calling by going into full-time ministry. If we look at the early church, if we look at Paul, for example, the tent maker, one of the most impactful characters from the New Testament, he had a day job while he did his ministry. What changed, however, was their lives when they answered God's call and accepted Him as their Savior. You can be where you are and work at the same capacity you have been working. What changes is the life you live, how you perceive things. You carry the insignia and the badge of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. In doing so, you also have the liability to live by the standards God has set for each and every one of us. The evidence of living a godly life is a requirement to enter His kingdom. Now, I don't want to go over why and why we must live godly lives once again. 
However, I would like to emphasize that in doing so, our faith becomes productive. When we live godly lives, our faith becomes productive. It becomes a testament. It is a transformation. In the process, you also end up setting an example through your life, one that others see. One life, that very life that you have, is the one that carries the light needed to dispel the darkness around others. You hold that torch, you hold that candle when you walk into the darkness, and you take the light of Christ into that darkness. And because of that, whether we know it or we don't, that very act might lead to the calling of others to know and accept our Lord and become fellow brothers and sisters and heirs, fellow members of the kingdom of God. Dear ones, do you carry your insignia and do you wear your badge of being an heir to the kingdom of God proudly? Do you uphold the necessary requirements needed to be heirs of the kingdom of God? Have you forgotten your past where you once were lost in the sea of darkness that is sin? To conclude this morning, I would like to remind us once again of the three points that we have discussed. The first being identifying yourself in Christ and in the knowledge of him. Do you know Christ or do you know of him? The second being characteristics of Christian growth. Are you growing in the right direction as a Christian, as a believer? And the third being citizens of the kingdom of God. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Do you meet its requirements? The love of God and his mercies are limitless. All we have to do is, is accept it and let him be our guide. Let us live our lives in a manner that speaks volumes of the love of God, of the love God has for everyone. Let us live lives that reflect the Christ that is within you, within me. Let us share Christ with others. Amen.